uh, since I did spend about two, three years of my life living with Arnold C. Gabeline uh, in the archives of uh, Dallas Seminary and in all of his books and, uh, and so forth. Uh, I will appeal to the Bible some, so keep your Bibles handy. We'll look at some examples of things. Uh, sometimes the presentation uh, alludes to the Bible, but we don't need to actually look at the Bible. It'll be self-evident uh, what is going on. Uh, but I do want you to understand the, the biblical background to uh, this particular individual. Uh, how many of you have heard of Arnold C. Gabeline before? Okay. How many of you have not? Okay. How many of you don't care? Anybody? <laughs> well, I hope I'll change your mind today if that's the case. Um, Roadmap for my presentation today. I'm going to start out with life and ministry of Gabeline. Very interesting character. And then I want to talk about his interpretation of the Bible and his view on grace, especially his overall view on the doctrine of salvation. And of course, grace is part of that. And he makes a very strong uh, historical contribution in our debates with covenant theology. And when we get there, I'll, I will uh, show that to you. Uh, and then I want to do, a, at the end, a survey of his writings uh, and let you know what's out there and maybe some of the books that you could look at uh, that might be helpful to you. So let's begin with a sketch of Gabeline's life. It's in four parts. We have the early years. He's uh, in Germany. He's a German who later comes to America. And then he has a decade of Jewish outreach and then he has the emergence of a national ministry. He becomes basically a national and international figure uh, in dispensational fundamental circles. And then uh, we have the Holocaust years, and we see the, the favorite guy the world loves to hate picture there, and the interaction that Gabeline has with Adolf Hitler. I guess they don't like me talking about Hitler. <laughs> uh, some uh, Nazi demons are in the room. Okay. <laughs> he was born in Germany in 1861. As during our Civil War, to give you some perspective, he was saved at 12 years old. Uh, then he surrendered to full-time Christian service in 1879. His family had moved to the United States. I don't know, is there something wrong with my particular thing here? So do I need to look this way the whole time? Um, do I have to start over? <laughs> He's born in Germany, saved at 12 years, 12 years old, but then he surrenders uh, to full-time Christian service in 1879. So you do the math. He's 18 years old. He's uh, entering college age. Uh, and like a lot of young people uh, who consider those things, uh, he gave his heart and life to do full-time Christian service not really knowing what that meant at that time. Uh, you'll discover he never goes to school, yet he is one of the top scholars in American dispensationalism. Uh, he's involved with the German Methodist in Lawrence. I guess we could understand why he would be attracted to a German group coming from you know, the German contacts that he had. And uh, so he hangs out with the German Methodists and there's a family, the Wallen family, Augustus and Louis. Augustus the son, Louis the father, became close friends of him and influenced him with the idea of premillennialism. Gabeline, as a young man, was what the average American Christian was at that time, post-millennial. That is not true today. By God's grace, premillennialism is still number one among evangelicals but it's slipping. We're worried about that. 
But at that time, number one was overwhelmingly post-millennialism. And he never considered anything else until this family introduced him to the idea that Jesus is coming back to earth to set up a literal earthly kingdom. And this family also told him to avoid going to seminary. Now, I happen to be the academic dean of a seminary. So I sometimes cringe when people say, don't go to seminary, it'll mess you up. What I say is, go to the right seminary so you don't get messed up. Okay, that's what I say. Uh, but in that day, remember, that's the day of the rise of higher criticism, coming out of Germany primarily, but invading all the schools, and the schools were going liberal. And so conservatives were afraid of the schools. So I understand this, and I think it makes sense. Uh, a lot of the fundamentalist schools had not yet started at this point in time. He pastors a church in Baltimore as a Methodist, and you see the uh, very short stint. I don't know how long Dennis Roxer has been pastor here. How long is that? 27, 27 years. You never see that in the Methodist circles. <laughs> you know, they have the rotation system. Uh, they figure, okay, man's run out of sermons after every two years, and so they move him on somewhere else. And so that happened with Gabeline in the rotation system of the Methodists. Uh, so he has moved, uh, well, let me, before I tell him where he's moved again, uh, he finds out something as a young man that he has a tremendous aptitude and interest in Semitic languages. He actually, although he doesn't get a degree, he attends for a semester or two taking a few classes in Semitic languages at Johns Hopkins University. And he is very good at it. He is one of those genius people that picks those things up. I don't have that spiritual giftedness. I work at it. He didn't seem to work at it. In fact, later on when he has a ministry to the Jews we'll talk about in New York City, you know, he put up a shingle, uh, a sign out in a storefront and say, out of an auditorium and say, come hear what a Gentile has to say about the future promises uh, uh, relative to Israel in the Bible. And he'd have several hundred Jews would come on Saturday afternoon. They didn't have football in those days. And they'd come listen to him, and during one of his messages, a rabbi stood up who had come and started jawing at him and said, you're a liar. I know you're a liar because your Hebrew is too good. You can't possibly be a Gentile. That's how good he was in the languages. Not just his ability to read and understand and go into classical Hebrew in the Bible, but his speaking ability was overwhelmingly wonderful. He picked it up very well. Uh, so he has an interest in that, and he actually considers being a missionary to the Middle East or Far East. But he's moved by the Methodist to Harlem in the New York City back in the 1884. And while he is there, he meets a future wife named Emma, a pastor's daughter. And they have a little girl who dies in 1886. I wanted to share that to humanize him a little bit, because sometimes we look at the past heroes in a kind of a plastic way, and we want to make sure not to do that. These guys are people like us, and they endure the same kinds of difficulties. We talked about suffering uh, early this morning. Um, and his little girl dies. In his autobiography, he does not give her name. I found that interesting. He does refer to her as his little pilgrim, but does not give her name. And he's writing that in 1930, many decades later. And I could sense he's, the hurt that's still there. And that mission's impulse in Gabeline, that you know, his thinking about his language abilities and how that might be used on the mission field. And he reads A.T. Pearson's book, The Crisis of Missions. And that greatly stirs him. And so in his heart, he is an evangelist and into missions, and he is praying about the possibility of going overseas. But then, uh, he's moved to Hoboken, New Jersey, a larger congregation. I assume that meant he was doing well in his Methodist church ministry. 
And while he's there for one year, he is persuaded to join with the Hebrew Christian mission. He already does well in Hebrew, right? And so he starts this active ministry that is so successful uh, that he actually uh, asked to be a full-time Methodist missionary to the Jews in New York City and, and stop being a pastor and do total missions work. That's what he wanted to do. So he has this outreach to Orthodox Jews, many of them poor. That stereotype of the Jews being rich, you need to throw that away. Yeah, there are uh, the Jewish bankers and the Rothschilds in Europe and all that, but a lot of Jews were not rich. And so you need to put that away from you. He was ministering to poor, and he had a social uh, action where he was feeding poor immigrant Jews who were flooding into the United States, getting away from the pogroms in Europe and Russia and places all over. And like I told you earlier, he, quotes, he converts from post-mill to pre-mill. Now, why does he do that? There are a couple of reasons. The first one is this guy. Now, I know he's not the best-looking guy in the world. Emil Gere, Geneva. He pastored a church there with some other guys. He was more a little Presbyterianish, but he was a brethren. The church they called themselves the Brethren. Actually started before the Plymouth Brethren that Darby came out of. But Darby and Gare knew each other. Darby came in 1837 to speak in Gare's church for several months. And that's 1837. Gare writes a book in 1856, The Future of Israel. That's the book that Wallen had given him to make him think about premillennialism early on. Initially, Gabe Alain did said, yeah, that's nice, but he didn't accept it until he starts ministering to the Orthodox Jews in New York City. And let's look at these two uh, influences upon Gabe Alain, and I find them uh, extraordinary in their significance. In terms of Emil Gare, and that's not Emil Gare's picture there, I think you know who that is. I've got his name up there, and just in case you didn't get it, that's Charles Ryrie. Now, why would I put that there? In the Future of Israel, that book that Gear, uh, that Wallen had suggested to Arno C. Gabeline, and Gabeline mentions in his autobiography, he says, when I started my Jewish outreach to the Jews, I started uh, asking some questions and looking at things differently in the Bible, and I was forced to go back and get a copy of that book that the Wallens had showed me and it was Gare's copy, The Future of Israel. And Gare, in the first 50 pages, talks about here are the basic methods in approaching the Bible. And number one was literalism. And he describes it very clearly. It's what we today call literal interpretation. That means grammatical, historical interpretation. It does not mean that we dispensationalists don't believe there are figures of speech or, or symbols. We certainly believe there are figures of speech and symbols. But we just take those at face value. We just don't hold allegory. We're not searching for hidden meanings. That's what allegory is. Where does allegory come from? The imagination of the reader. Right? We look for textual meaning. Things are in the Bible. We understand that language all the time uses um, figures of speech. Now, I'm a southern boy. I'm originally from the state of Alabama. And I'm a missionary on duty in Pennsylvania, trying to win the Yankees to the Lord. Okay. Down, I've discovered something by being around all my Yankee friends, is that I speak in more metaphors than they do because of where I'm from. You know, they're liable to say up where in Pennsylvania, you know, when, they, uh, kids, when the kids are acting up, They'll say to them, if you don't stop it, I'm going to spank you. Okay. Down south, we say it differently. If, if uh, you don't stop acting up, we're going to be on you like a tick on a hound dog. <laughs> you know what? The kids understand that literally. <laughs> they don't have to go searching for hidden meanings. They take the metaphor at face value, and they get it. Well, and Gare got it. He explained that very clearly in the same way a modern dispensational scholar would explain it. 
when was he right? In 1856. And then he says the second principle is diversity of classes and privileges in the entire body of the redeemed. Fancy way of saying distinction between Israel and the church, which he does go on to explain. That's exactly what he means. Now you may, if you've done any reading in Charles Ryrie, you may understand why I put his picture up. In 1965, Dr. Ryrie wrote a book called Dispensationalism Today, and he said there are three points, three major essentials to approaching the Bible. And the first two are literalism and a distinction between Israel and the church. Progressive dispensationalists, if you don't know who they are, that's probably a good thing. Um, a new movement came out in the 80s. Uh, they would say that Ryrie's synthesis, presentation of these these uh, three essential points that he had was a brand new thing in history. Never occurred before. And then I discovered Emil Gear. And Ryrie's synthesis is not brand new. Ryrie is consistent with the entire dispensational tradition, and, and Ryrie had never read Gear. The third point that Gear had was the literal value of the word day in prophecy, so that when you read uh, the word Day, for example, the 1260 days in the book of Revelation, that is, guess what? 1260 days. It's not rocket science. Now, the average uh, interpretation, even up into the early 1800s, the average Christian believed if it was a prophetic passage and it said day, they thought it meant year. They got that from the past, and they were wrong. Jonathan Edwards did that. Jonathan Edwards, um, you know, and I, I respect Jonathan Edwards. I do. He's sometimes considered the greatest American theologian, and I appreciate many things about him. Uh, but what I tell my friends when they get too enamored with him, I say, well, let's, let's look at Jonathan Edwards. He is a baby baptizing, post millennial, historicist, date setter. That's what I say about him. Now, as a Baptist, I can't handle the uh, baby baptizing part, right? I struggle with that. Uh, he's post-mill. Uh, he's a historicist, and that means that he, set, he believes he's living inside the bubble of fulfillment. All the seals and trumpets and bold judgments he maps out in, in church history from 606 to 1866 and makes predictions because he's living in the 1730s. And he's the first Y2K theologian. He predicted the millennium would start around 2000. That's Jonathan Edwards. Emil Gear didn't hold to that. Neither does Ryrie, neither does the dispensational tradition. One of the key things about our literal understanding is that day means day. And of course, as part of that, as Gabeline got into his ministry, ministering to the Orthodox Jews in New York City, there's another word. Israel means what? Israel. You say, isn't that obvious? Not to our covenant friends. Oswald T. Allis accuses those of us who are dispensations. I think he was writing in the 1940s, and he did many good things for the Lord. In the 1940s, though, he said, you dispensationalists, you have to check out his book, Church and Prophecy. You dispensationalists are extremists. And one of his examples was, you take the word Israel to mean Israel. So as you sit there, you need to understand how radical you really are. <laughs> I have a couple quotes in, uh, from Gabelan relative to his ministry to the Jews in New York City. Because why did he go off and ask to get that book again, Emil Gere's book? that was the first introduction to him of premillennialism, is because he had to answer questions as he ministered to these Jews. He came in with his postmillennial gospel. And the Orthodox Jews pushed back. And they asked, what about the promises to David? And here's a quote from uh, the autobiography of Gabeline. He says, this initial attempt to bring the gospel to the Jews led me deeper into the Old Testament scriptures. I began to study prophecy. Up to this time, I had followed in the interpretation of Old Testament prophecy, the so-called spiritualization method. 
That's allegory. Israel, that method teaches, is no longer the Israel of old, but it means the church now. For the natural Israel, no hope of a future restoration is left. All their glorious and unfulfilled promises find now their fulfillment in the church of Jesus Christ. But as I came in closer touch with this remarkable people, those who are still orthodox, I soon had to face their never-dying hope. As I began to read their moxerim, their rituals and prayers, I found the expressions of hope and longing for Messiah's coming. Do they not say each time Pesach is celebrated, commemorating their supernatural deliverance out of Egypt's slavery, this year here, next year in Jerusalem? Many an old, long-bearded Orthodox Hebrew assured me that the Messiah, the son of David, the Bethlehemite, will surely come to claim David's throne. In the beginning, it sounded foreign to me, but as I turned to the Bible, I soon discovered the real hope of Israel and the truth of the promised return of our Lord and their earthly glories connected with that future event were brought through the Spirit of God to my heart. Then, the study of the Bible became my most fascinating occupation. And as I continued in my search, I knew that the Lord wanted me to turn aside from the regular ministry and devote myself to work among God's ancient people. Another quote that he gives, he says, Old Testament prophecy has been much better understood by the old synagogue than by most Christian commentators. That's a zinger, in case you didn't catch it. Many a Christian doctor of divinity has, with a few sentences, Dismiss the carnal, and he puts that in quotation marks, the carnal expectations of the Jews and the literal interpretations of the rabbis and erected his own phantom. But nevertheless, the Jew with his carnal expectations and literal interpretations holds the truth. Yonder old Orthodox Jew, faithfully keeping the law and daily expecting his Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, waiting for him in his kingdom, believing in all the prophets said concerning the restoration of all things and Israel's glory is a far more inspiring sight to us than many a professing Christian who has very little knowledge of the word and none at all of God's purposes and who moves in a literal narrow circle. There are many Orthodox Jews who wait as eagerly for the Messiah as the true and Orthodox Christian waits for God's Son from heaven. The Jew has in his many and ancient writings a wonderful treasure which a Christian never dreams of the Targumi, Midrashim, and Talmudic literatures filled with valuable suggestions read and understood by not many Gentiles. The Jew has in these writings a wonderful eschatology or teachings on the last things, the end of this present age and the world to come, which will no doubt astonish many of our Christian friends. So what's Gabeline saying? He said, I started hanging out with these Jews, and they actually made me start reading the Old Testament. And as I read the Old Testament, if I took it at face value, I had to admit that my post-millennialism was wrong. So here, he changes. And as a result of that and the influences that are going on, we have an emergence of a national ministry for Gabeline. He becomes not just this missionary to Jews in New York City, but he becomes an itinerant Bible teacher that travels all over the country and is known nationwide and even internationally. One of the ways that is is by Our Hope magazine. In 1894, all the way, in fact, all the way to 1945, that is the number one circulating mag is Christian magazine in North America. It's edited and 80% of it written by Gabeline. It's a Bible study magazine, no advertising. Some things about current events, some historical articles about what's happening in Israel. The rest of it is an exposition of Isaiah, exposition of Matthew. And that is on the dinner tables and on the, in the living rooms of more evangelical Christians than any other magazine. And it helps spread dispensationalism throughout America. Well, initially, when, when he had started his ministry to the Jews, he became a Messianic uh, Jewish guy. What does, what does that mean? It means he thought that Jews should still keep all the ceremonies. They should still do the Sabbath. They should still do all of their feasts, even after they become Christians. And uh, he rejects that, though, uh, toward the end of the 1890s. 
And I think that's important because we don't hold, at least I don't hold to that. I don't know what y'all hold to it here. Um, I don't hold to that. Most dispensationalists have avoided Messianic Judaism because we believe in the unity of the church from Ephesians. Uh, the walls broken down between Jew and Gentile so that a, a Jew who comes to Christ today, he's not going to inherit the land promises. As a Jew, he's going to inherit the promises with Christ, uh, us being in Christ and the special unique things that we have with Jesus. Uh, so he avoids that and rejects it. He also withdraws from Methodist over higher criticism. In fact, he stormed out of a meeting one time of Methodist preachers, and the Methodist preachers adopted higher criticism. And he stormed, back, stormed out and never went back. He left the Methodist church because they had adopted a view of the Bible that did not believe in inerrancy. So he was a man of great convictions. He also became, in the 1890s, part of the Niagara Bible Conference movement with James Brooks and somebody you may have heard of, C.I. Schofield. Everybody heard of C.I. Schofield? Okay. A small figure in dispensational history. He also comes in contact with the Plymouth Brethren, some Plymouth Brethren who have Darby influences from John Nelson Darby. But the Niagara Bible Conference falls apart. After Brooks dies in 1897, it falls apart in 1901. Schofield then... Gabe and I are the leaders of the pre-trib faction, and it falls apart over the debate concerning the timing of the rapture. But that helps, actually. As a result of that, Gabe Lyon becomes an itinerant teacher. Uh, there are regional conferences that spark, come up all over the nation. Instead of one national conference, in Ni not the Niagara Bible Conference, one conference a year. Now they're regional all over the United States, same speakers going, and they're, the, they're Schofield and the dispensational guys, and they're starting to spread all over the United States. Uh, he's also uh, an associate editor on the Schofield Reference Bible, which I think you've heard of. In fact, Schofield said that he pretty much let Gabeline write the prophecy parts of that. Uh, Dallas, what's now Dallas Seminary, he was a speaker, a teacher, in fact, it was interesting the way that worked in those days. In the mornings, some outside speaker would come into Dallas Seminary and, and do an exposition for a month. Say, H.A. Ironside. Have you heard of H.A. Ironside? He'd come in for a month and do an exposition of the Gospels. And then he'd leave, he'd go to Moody. And then Gable and I would come in behind him and do the major prophets for a month. And then, Moody, and then Ironside would go to Biola out in California and then... Gable and I would go to Moody, and another guy come into Dallas. And they had this network of teachers that, again, which helped to spread dispensational truth around the country. And then Gabeline wrote a lot. By my count, at least 52 books. I may have missed one or two of them. Brother, you'll have to count yours and let me know how many there are. I have 52 of them. Uh, he wrote more than Lewis Berry Chafer and C.I. Schofield put together. And so he is a major figure. In the Holocaust years, uh, there's some controversy because Gabeline was accused of being anti-Semitic. Our Hope magazine makes mention of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in 1920 and 1921, and in a positive way. Now, what's uh, troubling in the modern world is that who is it that's making use of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion today? That's a little pamphlet being used by the Muslims against Israel. What does that pamphlet say? Its, uh, its origin is a little unknown, but late 1890s, early 1900s in Russia. And it's a story of how Jews have gotten together and planned to take over the entire world. And it's an anti-Semitic pamphlet. And he positively affirms it. 1920, 1921. Henry Ford, you, got, you folks know Henry Ford? Not personally. He took out, uh, had like four major articles in the Dearborn newspaper in Detroit, uh, hailing the protocols of the elders of Zion as the truth. And Gabeline and a lot of people in culture are wrestling with those things. In 1939, Gabe repudiates the protocols, as many others do as well. But at this time, why would he do that? 
Well, one of the things that he believed, I think, was that in the end time days, atheistic Jews would rise up and persecute religious Jews. And so he thought that's what the protocols of the elders of Zion helped to support, at least initially. And he wrote a book in 1933, The Conflict of the Ages, which reads like a conspiracy novel, uh, in which he attacks a lot of things and has a trail of things happening in culture. And a lot of people took that to be anti-Semitic. It's interesting that they take it that way, since no statement ever by Gabeline suggested that he hated Jews just because they were Jews. He had spent a whole decade ministering to Jews and loving them. And he is very pro-Israel. Now, Israel's not a nation yet, but he believes, in, he's a Zionist. Israel has the right to exist in the land. That's biblical, by the way. Israel has a right to exist in the land. Uh, a lot of people don't believe that in the world. I think you've noticed that. Since 1948, 50% of all resolutions by the United Nations against nations have been against Israel. 50%. Now stop and do the math. Is Israel responsible for half the problems in the world? No, and of course the other half is the United States, but they don't do resolutions against us because because we, we bankroll the United Nations, let's be honest, okay? But Gabeline makes a trip to Germany in 1937. Remember, he is German, but this is the first time he's been back since he moved to the States. And he is horrified by what he sees. And he comes back, and in the pages almost every month of our whole magazine, he warns about the coming Holocaust. He was one of the first to do that. And what does, the, uh, what does the liberal Protestant groups do? They mock Gibeline. And in the end, he turns out to be right. And some of the claims that he was anti-Semitic, I think, is uh, because he called the bluff early and understood what was going on. And he understood what was going on because he thought the Bible predicted a time of Jacob's trouble. And he thought that he predicted uh, Satan always hates the Jews. And so he saw it coming. And he told it like it was. Now let's move to his theology. Let's look at his, particularly how he interprets the Bible. Now I've got three things up here. Covenant theology, Gabeline, and Charles Ryrie. And we just have to be honest on this one. If you look at the historical narratives in the Bible and the prophetic passages in the Bible, the covenant guy, if you go back to Oswald T. Alice, no covenant guy will admit this today, but back in Oswald T. Alice's time, 1945, uh, he was very honest, and he said, I'm literal in historical narratives, and I have the right to allegorize prophecy. Charles Ryrie comes along in 1965, and he says, we need to be consistently literal. That is, we are also literal in prophecy, just like we are in the history parts of the Bible. Now we come to Gabeline. Gabeline would not tell the amillennialist uh, not to allegorize. Gabeline told the amillennialist, you're allegorizing the wrong part of the Bible. And you say, wait a minute. I thought Gabeline was a good guy. Yes, but we have to be honest. Gabeline practiced an extreme typology when it came to narratives. And he had a false belief, and here's the false belief. He believed that every single verse in the Bible was prophetic. Do you believe that? Every verse in the Bible is prophecy? I don't believe that. But he did, and there's a small strand of dispensationalists in the early 1900s who did. And if that's true, if you're in a prophecy, what do you got to do with it to make it prophecy? Just take it at face value, and you're already there. But if you're in a narrative, what do you have to do? You got to do something with it to make it prophecy. So you use typology, or you made it stand for something else symbolically. And that's exactly what he did. 
he allegorized historical narratives. Now let me give you examples of both. Uh, where Gabelion got it right is exactly where we want him to get it right the most. When it came to the literal promises to the nation of Israel, he was right there. And a literal description of the church in Ephesians, and he referred to the church truth as the highest truth. So he didn't look at the church. We've been misrepresented as we look at the church as an afterthought. We don't look at the church as an afterthought. Uh, to Gabelion, it was the highest truth. Uh, the masterpiece of the church was a special thing. So you have the literal promises to the nation of Israel, the literal description of the church in Ephesians, and of course those two come together and help us understand there's a distinction between Israel and the church. And Gabeline worked hard not to confuse those things. But what about the typology, the allegory that's in Gabeline? Uh, and the examples are in the patterns that you see. And I've got one example. Let's take your Bibles and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We'll illustrate one, just one of these. If you, if you want to see some others that Gabeline does, you can buy my dissertation. It's only $119 on Amazon.com. It's not selling very well, by the way. <laughs> Gabeline, one of the things he did, he loved the panorama of the ages. Don't we like those charts? None of which agree with each other. You know, the panorama of the ages, we have our charts. Okay? And uh, usually we got the panorama down, but the details we don't have that we agree with. The panorama. And what he did, he went looking through the narratives for historical things that happened that would help him promote this panorama of the ages in his mind. And here's one of them. Okay, if you come to John 1, come down to verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he sees that as a picture. That whole section there is a picture of the present church age. Then you come down to verse 35. He says, The next day. Now we move to a different age. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God, uh, etc. And, uh, and he says, this section is the national restoration of Israel after the second coming. Now, look hard. I, uh, look hard, and if you find it, send me an email. Because I don't think it's there. And then the third day, chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, a wedding. Ah, we can go to Matthew 22, and the coming kingdom's described as a wedding. Okay, so he says, oh, there's a picture of the millennium, because we're at the wedding of Cana. And so he has this, in the narrative, a panorama of the ages. And he does this all over the Bible in historical narratives. And it is his greatest sin in terms of interpretation. Now, he does not deny the literal meaning of these passages. He just puts a second level of meaning, a second layer of meaning on top of it, and he does this stuff. And, and sometimes our covenant friends will use him as an example against us. See, you dispensationalists don't always practice literal interpretation. And that's unfortunate. And I would encourage you in this particular thing to follow Ryrie and not Arno C. Gabeline. I'll talk a little bit more about the commentaries. Some other theological items, he had a little understanding of the biblical covenants. Abrahamic, Davidic, new covenants are unconditional. Mosaic covenant is conditional. He holds that the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God in Matthew's gospel. Uh, I don't, personally, because of Jesus' statement in Matthew 19, where he equates, uh, you remember the passage where it's easier for the camel to, the rich man to enter into the, uh, the camel to go through the needle than for a rich man to enter the what? the kingdom of heaven, Jesus repeats it again and uses kingdom of God. I think it's very hard to uh, justify the idea that uh, Matthew is using those as different things. Uh, but that, that makes its way into the Schofield Bible a little bit as well. Um, but one of the things that Gabeline held to strongly 
is inspiration and inerrancy. And I think one of the reasons he put up with some of that panorama of the ages all through the narratives is that he just got excited that that proved that God inspired the Bible. But even at face value, he believed the Bible had no errors whatsoever. I can remember years ago when I pastored in Arlington, Texas, I asked John Walvoord, who was then the chancellor of Dallas Seminary, to come speak in my church. He was in his 80s and uh, probably more vibrant and strong than I was. Afterwards, I took him out to a steakhouse for lunch. I just wanted, just dying to sit him down and ask him questions. And I asked Dr. Walvoord, what's the number one issue facing dispensationalists today? And uh, he said, young man, it's what it's always been, the inerrancy of the Bible. And then I got a little lecture from Dr. Walvoord. He said to me, and he said this in his books, you can be an amillennialist and be a liberal. You can be a postmillennialist and you can be a liberal. You cannot be a dispensational premillennialist and be a liberal. To be that, you have to believe the book at face value. And that's what we do. And Gabeline believes strongly in the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible and our tradition. We do not have to hang our heads there or apologize for anything. We believe fully in what God has given. Now, since this is a, a conference highlighting the idea of grace, let's look at Gabeline's doctrine of salvation. He accepted the fact of original sin, that there's something that grace has to be available for. Men are spiritually dead and under the wrath of God. Sounds like something we heard this morning. In fact, uh, my outline here follows Gabeline's summary of Ephesians 2. And the death of Christ on the cross is a vicarious suffering for sinners. He rejected limited atonement. He believed, as I do, that Jesus died for every person who's ever lived or ever will live. He wanted middle ground between Calvinist and Arminians. I, I kind of like avoiding labels myself because, you know, it depends on where you are, what part of the country you're from sometimes as to how people look at you. When I was in southeast, uh, the southeast part of the United States back in Alabama, uh, I was viewed as a hyper-Calvinist. And now up in Pennsylvania, I'm a hyper-Arminian. What am I? You know, people, if you believe in eternal security, they think you're a hyper-Calvinist in some parts of the country. So everything you have to define clearly. And he tried to avoid the extremes. In fact, he wrote an article in uh, Our Hope magazine. And some of you who know anything about John Wesley uh, would, would like this. His, the title of his article was The Calvinism of John Wesley. <laughs> it's kind of interesting reading. He clearly rejects salvation by good works. One simply accepts the free gift of life offered by God on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. I think he would say that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that sums it up. He sees repentance and faith as inseparably connected. I see his view there is exactly the same as Chafer's view. Lewis Barry Chafer. And here is his number one contribution, I think, in the area of salvation for us as a movement. Old Testament saints are saved the same way that New Testament saints are saved. Now, that's a contrast to the complaints that are thrown at both Lewis Barry Chafer and C.I. Schofield. They're accused of teaching two ways of salvation. The Jews in the Old Testament got saved by doing good works, the works of the law. And uh, church saints get saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's what the covenant guys say that Chafer and Schofield teach. In fact, I was at a conference a couple years ago. 
uh, where the speaker at one of the workshops was doing this very thing. He was a progressive dispensationalist, and he was criticizing Chafer and Schofield for that. And uh, I raised my hand. During the questions and answers, and I asked him had he ever read Gabeline. Gabeline's an associate editor of the Schofield Bible. Him and C.I. Schofield are great buddies. Gabeline taught at Dallas Seminary under Lewis Perry Schaefer. These two guys that are so troublesome to you, why don't you read Gabeline? Who wrote more than both of them put together? Here's Gabeline's words. No condition is mentioned. For there, that is the Old Testament saint's salvation, as well as ours, is not of works, but of grace alone. Dispensationalists have not taught two ways of salvation. Now, there have been some poorly worded things, I'll grant you that. But the tradition has never taught two ways of salvation. You don't find it in Darby, you don't find it in Schofield, you don't find it in in Ryrie, or Walford, or Pentecost, or Roxer. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> I haven't read all your stuff, so uh, I'll have to trust the crowd on that one. Salvation, start to finish in the Bible, is by faith alone. Surely in the Old Testament, they did not understand the object of faith like we do. In fact, we don't understand the object of faith as much as we will. You think when Jesus comes back and we get to look in his eyes that we'll understand more about the object of our faith? We will. The content of faith changes with time. But they still, in the Old Testament, looked forward to the Messiah dealing with their sin and trusted in him. They may have understood things um, a lot less relative to that. But nonetheless, they're saved by grace through faith. He has a strong belief in eternal security. That's what called him a, uh, and some called him a Calvinist. In fact, he went and preached in a church one time, a Methodist church. Uh, and after he left, word got back to him that the preacher said, after all that uh, Calvinism and premillennialism, I'm going to have to fumigate my pulpit. And, of course, the Calvinism was he was preaching eternal security. And that Wesleyan did not like that. Good works, according to Gabeline, can function as an aid in assurance of salvation. I think he would make that secondary to the objective word of God and the subjective work of the Spirit in our hearts, telling us we're sons of God. But he did say that it would, could function as an aid in assurance. In sanctification, the law does not serve as a rule of life for the believer today so that even in sanctification, grace, I think we heard something about that today too, grace is the prominent thing. This is a chart I use in some of my classes. I need to make some disclaimers at the beginning. Okay? That is not the eye of the Illuminati. The triangle is not any New Age mysticism, and it does not stand for the Trinity. Okay. This chart is uh, my attempt to explain Ryrie's third point in his threefold definition of dispensationalism. He talked about the doxological unifying theme of the Bible, that uh, God is doing a multi-track thing, not just one thing. See, the, the, the covenant guys have a one-track thing, individual redemption, not a multi-track thing. See, well, we say, oh, God's big. He's doing more than that. He's doing something. He created the world. He created the nations. So he's got a plan for the nations. He created Israel. He created the church. My triangle here is just to show in inverted order that the beginning point of the final fulfillment begins in reverse order. Rapture of the church, restoration of Israel, judgment and, and restoration of some of the other nations, and then redemption of the created order is the last thing. The, the dispensationists of the late 1800s, early 1900s talked a lot about this. Gabeline did. And there's, there is a plan for the salvation of individual men. You know, the most important thing to me is my individual redemption, right? But, you know, let's back up and look at God's thing. God has a lot of things going, many of them just as important as my individual redemption. 
And God has a plan for the lost. He has a plan for the angels. God is doing many wonderful things to his glory. And that's exactly what Ryrie was trying to tell us. And I've used Gabeline here to suggest this thing. Now, Gabeline wrote a book in 1935 called Hopeless, Yet There Is Hope. It is a marvelous book. And he talks about uh, the hopelessness of the present age. Uh, I think in my Wednesday DVD presentation, I asked you to look out the window and tell me if the kingdom had arrived in Duluth. Is the kingdom out there? Uh, it's not in Scranton. It is surely not in Scranton, where I'm from. The home of Joe Biden. It's just not there. The kingdom is not there. The city's broke. You know, there's no evidence that we're in the Messianic kingdom. If you look outside the window, it just isn't the case. And Gabeline talked about the hopelessness of the present age, but then he said, yet there is hope. This is remarkable that the Lord is talking to us this way. There's the hope of the church, the hope of Israel, the hope of the nations, and the hope of the created order, the world, the universe. And Jesus is going to come back and make all those things right. That is our ultimate hope. Gabeline felt that he was called to expound prophecy. But he was Christ-centered devotionally and theologically. And one of the things that he refused to do, he refused to speak on prophecy on the Lord's Day. So if he was invited to speak in a church and it was Sunday, he wouldn't speak on prophecy. He thought it was so sensationalized that people would be detracted from looking at the Lord in a devotional way. He had a heart for Jesus, not just prophecy, but he felt his particular ministry was prophecy to help the church understand the, the details of the Word of God prophetically. And I wanted to show you a major quote. This is my favorite quote from Gabeline. And I want you to listen to this carefully. This, this comes out of a, a chapter in his book. Um, there is but one answer to all these questions concerning the promised hope for Israel, for the nations of the earth, and for all creation. That answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the only answer, the completest answer, the never-failing answer to all our questions. But what do we mean when we give his ever-blessed and adorable name, the name above every other name, as the only answer? We do not mean that the answer is a practical application of the principles of righteousness declared by the infallible teacher in the Sermon on the Mount. We do not mean the practice of what has been termed the golden rule. We do not mean a leadership of Jesus. We do not mean that these questions will be answered by future spiritual revivals, nor do we mean that a blasted, this is interesting, a blasted Western civilization, misnamed Christian, will influence heathen nations to accept Christianity and turn to God from their idols. The sorrowful fact is that what military Christendom has done and is doing, and the shameful failures of Western civilization, has been a curse to heathen nations. What we mean, the only answer, the completest and never failing answer to all our questions is the glorious reappearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. This future event will answer every question, solve every problem which humanity faces today and all the existing chaotic conditions and bring about that golden age of which heathen prophets dreamed, which the Bible promises is in store for the earth. And that's why in the last pages of uh, his book, Hopeless Yet There Is Hope, he says, even so come thou hope of the hopeless, thou hope of Israel, thou hope of the world, all nations and creation, even so come, Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for God to hit the fast forward button. When I was reading uh, through the, reading the papers, the Lewis Perry Chafer letters to Gabeline and Gabeline's letters to Chafer in the archives at Dallas Seminary. I was fascinated by one thing which I 
I came to believe was not true of me, but was true of them. And it challenged my heart. Those two men really longed to see the coming of the Lord. I think I knew it was theologically correct to long for the appearing of the Lord. I'm not sure. I really, really in my heart longed for the coming of the Lord. And I think Gabeline's example, more than anything, helps us to love the Lord and his appearing. And love, to want, to long to see his face now. Gabeline had that. Well, let me wrap up uh, quickly on his, in his books. 52 books or articles uh, within books. His commentaries, there's a general annotated Bible. And I would suggest you get that. He does a lot less typology in that set. It's a multi-volume set doing a summary commentary of the entire Bible. Every book is covered. It's a several volume set. And if you use that, you'll, you won't be led astray into some of the strange typology. He has Old Testament commentaries on Exodus, Psalms, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Joel. Daniel, I think, is his best. In the New Testament, Matthew and John and Acts, those would have more of the bizarre things in them. Galatians, Ephesians, uh, 1 through 3, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians would be his best. When he's in the epistles, he's at his best. The book of Revelation, uh, he's, he's usually with us on that. However, the 144,000 Jews are literally Jews, but they're not literally 144,000 of them. He does Jewish numerology. 12 is the, you know, 12 is the number of government following Hebrew numerology, and 12 times 12,000, you really got a, you know, steroids there for the number 12, okay? And so he's got this governmental typology going on there, and so you need to watch some of those things. But if you can handle and understand that he's got that layer of things in spots like that, then Gabeline is extremely valuable in every area. He's a man of grace, and he is a man who loves the appearing of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. I pray you might use the information and the challenges that Gabeline gives to us through his life and ministry and through his writings. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us all to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. For it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Can you answer a couple of questions? I can do that. Okay. We're going to open it up for questions in just a moment. Uh, let me make just a couple comments, and then Dr. Stallard will handle the questions. You know what, I, what I'm so impressed with when I hear about the ministry of an A.C. Gabeline, and some things to keep in mind is that these men, Schofield, Gabeline, Pentengill, and others, original editors of the Schofield Bible and others, they believed in a literal Israel when there was no literal Israel. There was no literal Israel as far as a nation. And they believed, based upon the word of God, there was coming a day they, there would be another Israel in the land, as promised. You have to take your hats off. Furthermore, you have to remember, as in true in our lives, it was a progressive study of the word of God that refined their thinking on things. And they weren't, you know, they didn't hit home runs right off the bat, you know. And so often we come along and we're, we're gathering information on the shoulders of the shoulders of the shoulders of the shoulders of those who have studied before us. And we say to people, I don't know why they didn't see that, you know. And they're a blazing trail in a lot of ways. We greatly appreciate it. Now, Randy, see if you, you know, I was teasing Randy earlier. That was a joke, by the way. He will let you see his books. But um, wasn't it true Gabeline's been in Duluth? Yeah, I think he was at First Presbyterian Church. He spoke here in Duluth. If I remember right, I think he spoke in Long Prairie. Staples, too. In Staples. Yeah, in different places. I mean, he went along. He pastored at one time an Episcopalian Methodist church, mm -hmm. didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, odd combinations, but, <laughs> but such. So, and you know, I was thinking about yearning for the Lord's coming. You know, I was waiting for my book to be printed and come, and... I was yearning. And I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I am convicted. I do not yearn for you. And you're coming like I'm yearning for this book to come. 
And then when it's supposed to show up on a Friday and didn't show up, I was so disappointed. I'm thinking, I don't go to bed at night disappointed you didn't come back today. I'm convicted. What am I thinking? And I got over and the Lord surfaced the book. <laughs> I think there were some lessons to be learned there. Okay, let's take questions you might have in the audience. Yes, we'll start with Randy. I'll repeat the question and okay. you can answer, okay? Um, the question was, uh, Arnold Gabelang had a son named Frank, pretty well-known expositor, actually, and what were the differences or the influence upon him? Okay, Frank followed his father in being a dispensationalist. Well, you know, he wrote the foreword to Ryrie's book, Dispensationalism Today, in 1965. He was, he was also an editor in the New Schofield Reference Bible. So, you know, he, so he follows uh, in his father's footsteps as a dispensationalist. He uh, follows some of the maturing of dispensationalists in the 20th century, uh, the maturing of Walvert and Ryrie and those guys who make some small steps away from Chafer and some others and from the earlier dispensationalists. Less typology. I, I, see, I see in the post-World War II era, there is a tightening up of those categories so that, you know, so that we don't do the type, strange typology things. And you don't see that in Frank. Sadly, none of Frank's children became dispensationalists. They wandered away from dispensationalism. So that's, that's, that's a disappointment perhaps uh, there, but I think Frank had an excellent ministry. And he defended his father constantly uh, on the charge of anti-Semitism. Tom Stiegel? Uh, the question was, did C.I. Schofield have Arnold Gaveline write many of the prophetic passages, notes, in the original Schofield Bible? Yeah. Uh, yes, Schofield made that statement. It's Gaveline who gave Schofield the idea of doing the study Bible. After the Niagara Bible Conference fell apart in 1901 because of the controversy over the timing of the rapture, uh, Gabeline tries to keep an annual conference alive, and they, they move it to Seacliff, Long Island. Well, well Gabeline lives in New York City. That's very convenient for him. Uh, the, it doesn't succeed, but for two or three years they have that. And walking along the beach on Long Island, Gabeline and Schofield are talking, and Gabeline suggests the, the study Bible idea to Schofield and says he's the right guy to do that because he has become the spiritual leader of, of, the, of the crowd. Uh, so... Schofield thinks about it and eventually says, yes, I'll do that. Good. Yes, Drew? Okay, the question is, could you explain how good the statement that Gabeline made that good works could function um, as a, a secondary evidence of salvation. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea there is 2 Peter 1, that you can forget that you were saved if you don't build these things into your life. If you go read that passage, I think he's thinking about those kind of categories. Um, I don't think he is suggesting that, you know, the, the old Puritan, the, you know, many of the Puritans would make John MacArthur look like a grace guy. <laughs> you follow me? Okay. They were so extreme that a person could never get assurance until you'd lived a long enough life and you could look back and see a track record of good deeds, which meant you never had assurance until you know, some of you might have it you know, the very moment you die. Okay, so there's really not a present assurance. And Gabeline would never go like that. I mean, he would be horrified by that very thought. But I think in a, uh, the, the presence of good deeds doesn't help prove your say, but the absence of them may make you doubt your salvation. So I think that's the side that he would be on in that discussion based upon the Second Peter 1 passage. Drew, if you don't have my book, I explain that <laughs> in my book. 
They're on sale in the bookstore. Okay. Someone else? I think I saw another hand. Yeah? Yes, Mike? Uh, the question was, when he would teach on eternal security, it was called the Calvinist and an Arminian. I think a little clarification. There. Okay. No, I'm not saying he was called both of those. He was called a Calvinist because they believed in eternal security by some of the Wesleyans. By the Arminians. You know, it's kind of like, what's a five-point Calvinist called a four-point Calvinist? Arminian. Calls him an Arminian. <laughs> you know, and, a, you know, and on the Wesleyan, you have the same thing going over there. You know, anybody that holds eternal security is a... A uh, was a full-blown Calvinist. So uh, that's what I meant. Uh, what, I am, what I was suggesting is that he tried to avoid the labels. And he had people calling him both things. Like, and I gave my own life as an illustration that I'm, I've been called both things uh, simply because I'm not dying the wool on, in both camps. And it, maybe, maybe that proves that I'm right since I'm getting hit on both sides. Yeah. I, I think you're right. <laughs> No, I, you know, as a new, newer believer, I thought I was a Calvinist, Mike, because I believed in eternal security, because Arminians thought you could lose it, and I didn't, so therefore I must be a Calvinist. I didn't realize there could be a third position or whatever. Okay, Peter. Is there anything in his writings on how he uh, might have made it to central Minnesota and some of these small towns? Is there anything in his writings that might have explained how he ever came to Staples, Minnesota? <laughs> Uh, I can't answer that off the cuff, but his 1930 autobiography entitled Half a Century, uh, the autobiography of a, of a servant, uh, it's really a boring book. <laughs> it's a boring book, and he catalogs his trips. And so if you go check it out, I don't know if there's one copy nearby or anything, he may have it in there. I, I don't remember all the hundreds of places he'd been, but you know, he took the train to here, he took the train to here, he took the train to there. So he may mention Staples, Minnesota. I don't well, know. I kind of think I have a theory. <laughs> theory was he was writing a boring book, so he went to a boring place. That's what I kind of thought, but, but uh, <laughs> okay, somebody else have a question. Uh, by the way, this is my first time into Minnesota, so I have no clue what's going on here. <laughs> It, it, it's a staple of the conference, I mean so. Okay, okay, uh, somebody else have a question that I see. Okay, yes, Sylvia? Can you answer those five questions? <laughs> Send me an email. <laughs> uh, well, I would say this, Sylvia, that many uh, Reformed Covenant people will admit they were led to the Lord by dispensationalists. Because dispensationalists have a way of keeping the gospel clear and not muddying it up. Now, they were later taught um, lordship or covenant theology and so forth, though they weren't, didn't believe that to begin with. It just shows you the importance when people get saved of getting them established in sound doctrine. Otherwise, they're wide open game for the Christian radio covenant theologians to swoop in. Now I can say in my own testimony, I came to Christ in 1974. It was a Southern Baptist church that was, they were carrying the Schofield Reference Bible uh, and sending all their kids to Tennessee Temple, which was not a Southern Baptist school. Uh, and the pastor did a very good job of explaining the gospel. And, but they did give public invitations. And 
I think I heard the gospel for many years, and I was searching as a teenager. I was 20 years old when I came to Christ. I was a senior in University of Alabama when I came to Jesus. And I think commitment language used in gospel invitations kept me from coming to Christ. Wow. I believe that. And I think when I finally understood it, now, the Sunday morning church service, when I finally embraced the gospel, they gave a standard traditional southern invitation. And I came forward on the eighth stanza. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when the pastor asked us to come forward, uh, I didn't want to go by myself, so I reached out. I had my twin brother sitting next to me. We had been attending that church for two months, mulling things over. And I reached out to get him to walk down the aisle with me because I didn't want to go by myself. This is a big church. It's about twice the size of this church, maybe three times. And I didn't want to go forward. I was scared. And I bumped into his arm when I reached out to him because he was reaching out to get me to go with him. But we both became Christians. We were twins in the Lord that come to the Lord that day. Um, and I trusted Christ, but I, when I fully, I think the first time I fully understood the gospel, I embraced it. And I think some of the commitment language of various evangelists and others actually slowed me down in trusting the Lord. So, but remember what we believe. We believe in grace. And we have a powerful God who sometimes can slice, slice through even the Puritans, and get to the hearts of people with the truth. And so, uh, we, we, you know, if a guy comes to me and he comes from a Presbyterian church and he has trusted the Lord, I don't necessarily doubt his salvation. I'll certainly give him the test. <laughs> That's the survey. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think that's, that's so very true. And sometimes what happens is these guys use enough Bible that you get it before they screw up the punchline. Sometimes I think that's true with Billy Graham at times. Yeah, at yeah. least in yesteryear, more that sometimes people listen. They heard enough Bible, they got saved before they, he even gave the punchline. You know, kind of like Peter with Cornelius. It's just that Peter's punchline was going to be right, but Cornelius got saved before he ever gave the invitation. I think JB had his hand up. Did you? I didn't see JB. <laughs> I think it's because he believes in grace. That's what I was thinking. But uh, okay. if you want to believe in law, you go to Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm right. missing. Okay, Lyle. Okay, the question was, uh, where do you trace the roots of dispensationalism relative to 2 Timothy 2.15? And Emil Gares, how does he fit in? Yeah. Well, I, I start dispensationalism with the first century church, just so you know. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so I view modern dispensationalism as a rediscovery of the Jewish perspective of the Bible, okay, taking it at face value. Okay. In the church early on, second century, there's a revival of Platonic thought that destroys or uh, greatly diminishes the church's understanding of a literal earthly kingdom. So they abandon that. And the Reformation allows for discussions to, be, uh, to emerge again, and over time, uh, taking in at face value, eventually uh, a crowd sees a rediscovery of, of uh, those things. Now, I think it's happening all over, especially in the 1800s. Darby. John Nelson Darby gets credit for it because he is, was kind of the most famous systematizer of it in the 1820, late 1820s, early 1830s. Emil Gares in Switzerland, uh, Emil Gares is an interesting guy because he was at the seminary, of uh, the Genevan seminary. He's Presbyterian, you know, that's Calvin's home. Uh, and he's one of two seminary students expelled because they don't support 
the faculty and the pastors in the area for their denial of the deity of Christ. So Emil Gare believes in the deity of Christ. He believes in the historic faith. And as a result, he gets expelled from seminary. The question I have is, was he put to death by Calvin? I'm just joking, but I don't know if you know this, but Calvin actually had up to 50 or more people put to death because yeah. they didn't embrace his understanding of the Bible. Well, they had a saying in the, in the 1520s and 30s and 40s that if an Anabaptist, if an Anabaptist man was called to be a pastor, his wife was called to be a widow because there's so many of them. I mean, they just understood that they were going to be martyred. It was just part of it. Uh, but Gare, no, Gare was not killed. Okay? He did what a lot of people do today. They get mad, and they went outside of town and started their own church. And they called themselves the Brethren. Uh, and after the, uh, a few years, they were noticed, and the, the British were starting to travel on the continent now after the Napoleonic Wars are over, and they start to have people going back and forth. And Darby uh, gets saved late 1820s, and in 1837 visits Geneva and spends about six months there preaching and teaching in Emil Gere's church. Now, I think Emil Gere uh, didn't like Darby eventually because Emil Gere is Presbyterian. He believed in elder rule uh, for the congregation, but the congregation was listing congregational. And he was in a battle over that when Darby came. And Darby, as a Plymouth Plim Plim brethren, he's congregationalism on steroids. So when he comes, it hurts. Gare in what he's trying to do in terms of organizing his church. And so there's a kind of a parting of the ways between them. Eventually, Darby starts a church on the other side of Lake Geneva, there in Switzerland. But they, they always remain friends, and I think the impact Darby had was mostly in eschatology with Darby, and in maybe in method uh, as well, which leads to the eschatology. So that's the, that's the roots of, of that. And then the of course, it explodes in America, dispensationalism does. And some of the things that happened that helped that uh, in Europe and America is World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust. You know, it's hard to find a post-millennialist in the 1950s. There are some. It's hard to find them. I mean, the 1950s, they're, you know, and I'm dating myself, you know, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm in kindergarten in the late 1950s, and they're having drills in case an atomic bomb hits hiding under your desk, you know those kind of things, which seem kind of bizarre. Uh, but it was, it was a scary time. We just had the Holocaust, six million people killed by Hitler, and Stalin killed just as many Jews, just didn't get credit for it. Um, it's a horrible time, and it's hard to be optimistic about the human race right then. So postmillennialism is just almost killed. Uh, and premillennialism is just really looking good, because it seems to view the world in a realistic way. And just to keep in mind, post-millennial, at least, the world's going to get better, and then Christ comes back. So after the wars, everything's looking the opposite. It drives people away from it. Okay, yes, Sylvia. Uh, the question was, uh, in light of his allegorical interpretation of narratives, did he go through the process of growth and eventually shed a lot of that, or how do you explain it? Uh, sadly, I don't think he ever ditched that approach. And I, there were two sources for that approach, I think, that influenced him. One was uh, F.W. Grant, who gave us the numerical Bible. The other was, and I think maybe the stronger one, is uh, his contact with the Jews and the mystical Jewish rabbis with their numerology and their strange handling of scriptures. You know, I think it's, uh, it's, one, it's, a, it's one of those cases where something that's good, you get enamored with. Somebody helps you with something good, like 
a literal Messiah coming to set up a literal kingdom in fulfillment of a promise to David. That's literal and that's good. I mean, he got so enamored with that, he started listening to all the other stuff they were saying too. And uh, some of the rabbis were giving him mystical stuff. And I think he bought into that. And it helped him, he thought, demonstrate the Bibles in, uh, inspired by God, because only God could do such great things as put this panorama of the ages this way, scattered throughout narratives. It's almost a little like the Bible code stuff uh, that came out a few years ago. I don't think he ever ditched it. So he, but, but to keep it clear, Sylvie, he did interpret various passages like John 1 literally. He just thought there was another layer of understanding to it, and that was the problem. Is that correct? Yes, right? there's a literal wedding at Cana. Jesus literally turned the water to wine. But it also has a secondary meaning, so it stands for something else. Yes. Yeah, it could be yeah. literal slash allegorical. Yep. Okay, well, it looks to me like it's just about 3 o'clock. I think it'll be time to uh, conclude this. I, I, I feel deeply honored that Dr. Stallard could be here today. Again, I consider him one of the foremost authorities on dispensationalism, appreciate it greatly. If you have any personal questions, you want to come up and ask some more, I'm sure he'll be glad to do that. And so, uh, otherwise, Lord willing, we will see you tomorrow morning if you're staying at 9. Some of you I know are making drives back to your own local churches. So thanks so much, and with that, you're dismissed. <laughs>